So let's talk about the Barlow and Bear, the Netflix lawsuit. Okay, but what if Bridgerton was a musical? Now, if you're anything like me, you've seen quite a bit of commentary about this lawsuit on the internet from, um, I'm going to call them armchair lawyers, uh, expressing opinions that charitably, I'll say, lack some nuance on the subject. Um, I've seen extremes on both sides, people who are really, really upset at Netflix for how they could possibly bring this suit against two independent creators, and people who are really certain that um, Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear messed up, because obviously you can't take someone's IP without their permission. I think both sides of those takes are lacking in a ton of nuance, um, because I think there's a lot more uncertainty here. I think there's a lot more going on underneath the surface that just has kind of gotten lost in the conversation. And that's really what I want to do here today, is I want to just sort of explain as best I can what I think is happening in this lawsuit, you know, what the complaint actually says, what the legal claims actually are, what needs to be proven in those legal claims, and why this case might actually be kind of complicated. Now, who am I to say any of this? Like, why am why should you trust me over a random internet commentator? Well, you shouldn't trust me as like a foremost expert authority here. I'm simply not that. But I do have both a professional and educational background in intellectual property law and intellectual property lawsuits. And also I just have had a personal interest in pop culture copyright law for as long as I can remember. Every lawsuit involving pop culture copyright that has been filed in the last decade, I have probably looked into at least somewhat. I just have a very like personal interest in them. That said, I am not an entertainment and media lawyer. So there will be lots of parts of this where I lack insight, where I don't have the expertise to make sort of the judgment calls that an entertainment and media lawyer would have. That said, I do think I still can provide more than sort of the average person. And now just to get into a handful of sort of your normal disclaimers that are super fun. This is not legal advice. I am not your lawyer. I am doing this purely for fun. This is like entertainment educational purposes here. These are just like me expressing my own individual opinion on this situation. Let's start a little bit with some of the factual background here. I assume if you're clicked on this video and you're watching this, you kind of already know some of this, but just to catch everyone up to, the, to speed and provide a little bit of context, Netflix released Bridgerton season one in 2020 based off the wildly popular book series by Julia Quinn. The first season of the show was based off the first book in the series, The Duke of Die. Netflix's show quickly became wildly popular, not only in terms of watch hours, but also just in terms of like buzz um, on places like Twitter and TikTok. As part of that were Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear on TikTok, who started the idea of, okay, but what if Bridgerton was a musical? And through this, they started creating a series of TikToks where they would write in real time songs based on scenes or dialogue or feelings from the Bridgerton TV show into a sort of a narrative musical format. Right? <laughs> This project evolved and grew and grew and grew um, until it eventually, in fall of 2021, became a album that Barlow and Bear released on Spotify. This whole time, it was unclear to the public just how much Netflix was involved, how much of their blessing they had given, though it is clear and obvious that Netflix knew about it and um, even promoted it on some of their social media. After Barlow and Bear released their album on Spotify, it continued to grow. There was apparently a charity performance, but also like quite importantly, Barlow and Bear won a Grammy for it. This all culminates now in j late July when Barlow and Bear put on a live performance for profit at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. It is this performance that Netflix said was a bridge too far. Immediately after Barlow and Bear had this performance, Netflix filed the current lawsuit. So a couple weeks ago, Netflix filed a complaint. Now, what is exactly is a complaint? Well, a complaint is the formal legal document that a plaintiff files to start a lawsuit and lay out its side, give its facts, um, and also tell us specifically what legal claims it's making, which tell us what it will have to prove to win this case. And that's exactly what Netflix has done in this case. I wanna make one thing very clear is that these are all Netflix's allegations. The only legal document we have so far is Netflix's complaint, which tells its side of the story. We have not heard a response from Barlow and Bear. They will answer the complaint eventually, but so far they've not given like a public response. But I do just wanna say this to be clear that the current version of the facts that we have are the most positive 
version of the facts we're ever going to have for Netflix. This is Netflix's side of the story without a rebuttal. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we sort of go through the rest of this analysis, that the facts could change. Nothing here has yet been proven. Everything has just been alleged. So what does Netflix's complaint actually say? Well, it starts out, as all complaints do, with a factual recitation of Netflix's version of the story. A lot of this is just rehashing what I have just said, but it does fill in some of the blanks. In particular, it fills in the blanks with what Netflix is saying was happening behind the scenes between Barlow and Bear and Netflix. As Netflix tells it, yeah, they were aware of it, um, but they were in pretty regular communication with Barlow and Bear. And one of the things Netflix makes clear in this complaint is that it has never licensed its IP to Barlow and Bear. In fact, it says it has never authorized or approved of anything that Barlow and Bear has done. Instead, the way Netflix phrases it, which is interesting, will certainly be the subject of this litigation, at least in part, is that while it did not approve or authorize the creation of the musical, and in particular, the release of the musical on Spotify, it made clear that it would, quote, not be standing in the way. That's not a legal term, but it does at least indicate that Netflix was okay and kind of did soft okay the release of the album, even though, again, they say the whole time they've never approved or authorized anything. Netflix also makes clear that they tried to make clear the distinction between the audio-only album format and live performances. And at all times, they claim that they told Barlow and Bear that Barlow and Bear would need to seek permission for every individual live performance. So as Netflix tells us in early June, Barlow and Bear made Netflix aware that they're going to be putting on a live performance. Netflix then asked some follow-up questions. Hey, what exactly is this? How are you marketing it? What, um, are, are, is it going to be for profit? And a bunch of other questions. Um, Barlow and Bear come back kind of with an answer, but mostly just saying, we're going to do this. Um, Netflix then says, hey, you don't have our authorization to do this. They offer a license. And at that point, uh, Barlow and Bear say, we don't need your license. We're just going to go ahead with this. Negotiations break down. And then the performance happens. And it is a performance that Barlow and Bear sold tickets for that went up to as much as almost $150. They also sold merchandise um, at the show. And Netflix claims that they never gave permission to use the Bridgerton trademark, but Barlow and Bear represented that they were using the Bridgerton mark with permission at this show. And that's, this really is what Netflix makes it seem like the big fuss is about. And I think it's true that this is really the performance that, you know, broke the proverbial camel's back. And to round out the factual allegations that Netflix is making here, there's just two other things that it sort of points to um, that are going to be important for Netflix to make its case. One is Netflix tries to emphasize throughout all of this how much creativity it is putting into the TV show itself. And two, that Netflix also makes its own sort of derivative works that compete with this, these Barlow and Bear works. Namely, that it's selling merchandise for the Bridgerton TV show, it has released a soundtrack on Spotify of the songs that were in the Bridgerton TV show, and that it's putting on its own quote-unquote live Bridgerton experiences um, in cities across the world. That wraps up the factual allegations. Then we get into the actual legal complaints. This is the, like, the force of the complaint. It lays out exactly what causes of action that Netflix is asserting. And there are four of them. Copyright infringement, uh, unjust enrichment, trademark infringement, and um, false origin. I'm really only gonna be talking about two of them. As a quick aside, unjust enrichment is a contract claim, essentially saying, hey, you unfairly benefited from something. And false origin and trademark are kind of the same thing. False origin just says, hey, you're marketing this in a way that falsely identifies its origin, in this case, probably falsely associates it with Netflix. So let's start with the trademark claim. And no one's really talking about the trademark claim, but I think that's actually a mistake because I think the trademark claim could be important to this litigation. Just up front, I think the trademark claim is Netflix's best claim. It's the one that Netflix is most likely to win. That's because it's pretty clear from the way Netflix is telling the story that <laughs> Barlow and Bear did not have permission to use the Bridgerton mark. And if they did not have permission to use the Bridgerton mark, it's inarguable that they used it. They use the word Bridgerton a lot in their promotion. Their album is called the Unofficial Bridgerton Musical. They've apparently used it in connection with marketing the Kennedy Center performance. Uh, they've used it in marketing uh, other merchandise. They use it a lot. The important part is, are they using the mark in a way that will confuse consumers? Um, and I think the answer again is, if they're saying they're using it with permission, absolutely. It's not hard to see how someone could 
look at the Bridgerton materials that Barlow and Bear are producing and thinking, oh, hey, this is the same Bridgerton as that Netflix TV show. Even, if, even though it's called unofficial Bridgerton musical, I think it clearly crosses the line in, in many of these cases. That doesn't end the inquiry. Like that doesn't mean like, oh, okay, they win the trademark claim. So like, we're good, this, this lawsuit is over. No, because all the trademark, all winning the trademark claim does for Netflix is it lets them stop Barlow and Bear from using the mark. They could still put their album on Spotify and make live performances of it. They just can't call it Bridgerton anymore. Um, they would have to use a different name, which obviously would hurt their marketing, but would not be impossible. They could call it, you know, the Barlow and Bear experience or whatever. Or <laughs> as one of my friends jokes, and I think it's a great idea, they could just call the album Songs in the Key of Regency. Love it. Perfect. Uh, Barlow and Bear, why don't you guys get on that? The trademark infringement claim is important um, because it does give Netflix a lot of negotiating power. I think it will dictate a lot of the way this case is litigated and then ultimately settled. But it is true that winning the trademark claim doesn't actually solve Netflix's problem. That problem can only be solved by winning the copyright infringement claim. Now, the copyright infringement claim is where most of the discourse has been on the internet. And, you know, for good reason, it's the interesting part. It's the part that says like, hey, is this whole Bridgerton musical thing like legal? Can you actually do this? And a lot of the commentary here has sort of assumed that Barlow and Bear are obviously infringing Netflix's copyright by making this musical. But again, I think it's much more complicated than that, and it's much more unpredictable than that. Fair use cases involving artistic works are some of the most unpredictable legal cases that exist. It is really hard to say how a jury or a judge will decide on a subjective art piece. It's just not clear. There's no obvious answer there. That's both because art itself is subjective and because the test we have for determining whether something is fair use or not is incredibly squishy. It's not, there's no bright lines. That all said, I do tend to agree that Netflix has the better case here. I just don't think it's super obvious. So before we dive into the specifics of the copyright analysis here, I just wanted to provide some context on copyright generally in the US, because I think this important is important context to understand what a judge uh, will be looking at and sort of what we're talking about when we're talking about if something is authorized under copyright. The rationale for copyright law in the US is to incentivize the creation of valuable artistic works. You know, we've decided that creative artistic works are something we want to happen in this country. It's something we value. And so copyright law gives economic incentives, economic rights to artists in order to be able to make a living off of their work or to at least monetize their work. That's very different than how copyright is viewed in like the EU, for example, where a lot of countries in the EU have more of an artist rights approach to copyright law, which is to say copyright law is really about protecting like the dignity and the sanctity of art and artists themselves. It, they give much more credit to things like attribution and like defamation of art and artists. So that's one thing to think about as we go forward here. The answer to this question is all about what art do we think is worth incentivizing and how do we best incentivize the creation of these types of art? With that as background, I want to address just one more point. And that's a question I've seen a lot of people, like really well-meaning people ask, which is, hey, isn't this a musical adaptation of a TV show? I'm pretty sure that's like what optioning is about. I've heard and like licenses, like you just have to like license this stuff, right? Isn't that, isn't this a foregone conclusion? Like why isn't just an adaptation copyright infringement here? Like how could this literally be anything else? And like, that's a really fair question. The answer is that it's a little too simplistic again, because adaptation is not a legal term. Instead, what you'll see is the word derivative works. And yes, some derivative works are just infringing, but some derivative works are fair use or otherwise non-infringing. In the specific case of Bridgerton here, I think it's useful to think of it on a spectrum because what this is, is not a straight musical adaptation. It's something a little bit kind of in the middle. And to illustrate that, on one end, we would have something that's clearly copyright infringement, a classic adaptation that would require a license. That would be if they had produced a fully staged, full production, faithful adaptation 
of a Bridgerton musical. That's something with actors. That's something with costumes. That's something that's got a you know staging. It's got set design. That a full musical, actual musical, a hundred percent going to be infringement, going to require a license. On the other end, what if we had a fully instrumental album? What if this were fifteen songs? fully instrumental, but each one of the songs were was inspired by a specific scene in Bridgerton. It was aimed to evoke the same mood or emotion or theme that was in that Bridgerton scene. It's clearly 100% inspired by Bridgerton, but I do think almost every single person would agree you shouldn't need a license to be able to make and sell that. Like, that's a wholly original product. Copyright law would agree. Well, what if we go one step further? What if instead of a full instrumental album, now it's a album with lyrics, with each, instead of being just instrumental, each song is a pop song um, that conveys those same themes, but it's not taking the dialogue of Bridgerton. It just now has words to make it like more explicit and more clear that these songs share the same themes about, you know, falling in love or family or being the center of attention of gossip, right? Themes from Bridgerton but not using any of the actual words. These are now just a set of pop songs. Again, I think this sort of pop song album, almost everyone would feel comfortable with someone making and selling without a license. This doesn't seem, again, like something that Netflix should be able to control. And again, I think copyright law would certainly agree with you. Well, what if we push it one step further? For instance, now, what happens if each of the songs has a title that's taken from a line of dialogue of Bridgerton? What if one of the songs is called Burn For You? Again, this, I think, maybe more people start to th feel weird about this, but there's a lot of songs called Burn For You. I mean, just type Burn For You into Spotify. A, a bunch will pop up. Well, what if we push it a little further and now there are some lines of dialogue interspersed? Or what if we mention a character's name here and there? Again, as you keep pushing this further and further, people will then start to disagree. Now we're in the gray area of, okay, how much of this can we actually take and still be okay? And this is the area we're operating in when it comes to the unofficial Bridgerton musical. And I hope this helps illustrate a little bit of like how this can be a close question. Maybe you don't think the unofficial Bridgerton musical itself is a close question, but I hope you can see an album production that would be a close call. Finally, with all of that said as background, let's actually finally get to the copyright analysis. That copyright analysis proceeds in two very simple steps. The first step, did Barlow and Bear take any of Netflix's copyrighted material? The second step, if they did, was that use authorized in some way? The first question seems fairly straightforward. Did Barlow and Bear take any of Netflix's copyrighted material? It seems like the answer is definitely yes. And the answer is definitely yes. But I still think it's worth walking through to explain a little bit about what we mean by copyrighted material. And again, how at each stage this adds a little bit of nuance. To understand this, we have to know first, what is capable of being copyrighted? Well. In copyright, there's this dichotomy between ideas and expression. And in copyright, expression is copyrightable, but ideas are not. This is because copyright law understands basically that there's a huge set of abstract ideas that we shouldn't allow any one author or artist to own. So what does this mean? This means ideas like tropes and character archetypes and story structure are not copyrightable. Instead, what's copyrightable is the expression of those things. That's specific line of dialogue, or in the case of the Bridgerton TV show, the actual visuals of the Bridgerton TV show. Certainly sequencing, specific sequencing of plot and specific plot events are copyrightable. The other thing to consider here is what is Netflix's copyright? Because actually, Netflix only asserts the copyright it owns in the TV show episodes in this complaint. It asserts eight copyrights, one for each episode. Because Netflix's TV show is based on Julia Quinn's book, that means Netflix's TV show is itself a derivative work. And it really crucially here means that Netflix's copyright only extends to the expression that is original in the TV show episodes. Anything that originates in Julia Quinn's book is actually, at this moment in time, not part of this lawsuit. Which means things like the basic plot structure of Bridgerton, all of the characters, probably some of the dialogue. I don't, I've never read the original, so I don't actually know the extent to which any dialogue was lifted. All that stuff, which is original to Julia Quinn's book, is technically not in 
the lawsuit right now because it is not co covered by Netflix's own copyright in the TV show. I wanna pause here because this is a really important point. If Netflix never asserts and cannot assert the book's copyright, that's really fatal to its claim. And that's because the things that Barlow and Bear are taking are not the visual presentation that exists in the TV show, but it's really like things like character and plot that probably exist in the book itself. I mean, certainly maybe some lines of dialogue were lifted from the TV show that were not in the original book, in which case, obviously, that would be part of Netflix's TV show copyright. But it becomes really tough to see how Netflix could win without asserting the book's copyright. It becomes so tough to see that I feel pretty certain that Netflix can assert the book's copyright should it need to. It just hasn't yet. Uh, this is where me not being a media and entertainment lawyer uh, is really going to limit my understanding of exactly what's going on behind the scenes here. I know from copyright law that Netflix can either assert Julia Quinn's copyright by joining Julia Quinn as a party to this lawsuit and having her assert the book's copyright. There might be a contractual obligation for Julia Quinn to do this, like a litigation cooperation clause, basically a joint defense clause in their lawsuit. I mean, rather, in their contract. I don't know for sure. Julia Quinn seems at least willing to be co and willing and cooperative with Netflix, so it seems like this is a possibility. And the other potential way is if Netflix is the exclusive licensee to rights and derivative works that would cover um, the Spotify album, then it could itself, without Julia Quinn, assert the book's copyright. Again, because I don't know what the contract might look like between uh, Julia Quinn and Netflix, I don't know exactly what exclusive derivative rights um, Netflix has. And it seems like it's not obvious from the contract that it does or does not, because if it were really obvious and easy for Netflix to assert the book's copyright, I think they would have already done it. The fact that it's not in the original complaint makes me think that there's some diligence that Netflix needs to do on its part in order to make sure it can properly assert um, the book's copyright, and that it just didn't have time to do before filing this complaint because it wanted to stop Barlow and Bear from making any further live performances. From here on out, I'm going to assume that Netflix can assert and has asserted the book's copyright because I think, again, if it doesn't, I think its claim falls flat on its face. So Netflix can obviously show that Barlow and Bear have taken uh, Netflix's expression in the creation of the unofficial Bridgerton musical. That's what a lot of this complaint is about. It points to very specific lines of dialogue that were taken, but also characters that were taken and plot beats that were taken um, and scenes that were quote unquote taken. It's really helpful for Netflix that Barlow and Bear documented all of this on TikTok. But they still have to try to argue that this audio medium has taken expression from a TV show, a visual medium. And I only bring this up because actually there's a lot of difficulties in articulating that. It's really easy to say something like, you've taken this dialogue and just pointing to the dialogue that's taken. And I think that's, those are Netflix's strongest claims. It's much harder to say like you've taken the essence of this character and then trying to explain that in a way that sounds authoritative and legal and makes it clear that you're talking about expression and not ideas. For an example of what I mean by how difficult this is, I just want to point to one of the sections in Netflix's complaint. They have a full exhibit that shows all the proposed similarities between the unofficial Bridgerton musical and Netflix's TV show. While yes, it is a lot of stuff, the way Netflix has to argue it can sometimes feel clunky. And you can see how in front of a judge or in front of a jury, you might look at this and be like, ooh, I, this feels like a stretch. In episode one, scene 81, Simon proposes a ruse so that he can achieve his goals. He, as an extremely eligible bachelor, will get the freedom he seeks from mothers intent on marrying off their daughters. This eligibility has been highlighted in Lady Whistledown's publications. In dialogue spoken by Simon, he offers to Daphne, With you on my arm, the world will believe I have finally found my duchess. I presume Lady Whistledown will deem us precisely what we are. Me, unavailable. You, desirable. That's how Netflix explains its expression in the TV show. And now, listen to how it has to show that the unofficial Bridgerton musical has taken that expression and just kind of how awkward it sounds. The musical also appropriates the development of Simon Bassett's character. He's an extremely sought after single Duke who wants nothing to do with matchmaking, matriarchs, or coverage by Lady Whistledown. In lyrics, the song shares Simon's explicit point of view. Maybe there's another way, another role to play here to keep the press and the desperate mothers at bay. I mean, yeah, okay. Sure, you've taken it, but when it's not clearly lines of dialogue lifted, you can see how this could cause trouble um, for Netflix's arguments. It just becomes a little bit more difficult. That said, because Barlow and Bear have recorded this, 
um, and have directly said what they're inspired by and the extent to which they've taken dialogue. Grosvenor Square, 1813. Grosvenor Square, 1813. Dearest reader, the time has come to place our bets for the upcoming social season. Dearest reader, the time has come to place our bets for the upcoming social season. Consider the household of the Baron Featherington. Consider the household of the Baron Featherington. That's all why I think that Netflix is more likely to win this case than not. Again, there still will be difficulties in arguing that case. The other thing I want to note here is that I have been talking about the album um, on Spotify a lot when I'm talking about this copyright analysis, and I haven't been talking about the Kennedy Center performance. That's because while Netflix makes a big deal about how the Kennedy Center performance is what they're objecting to and what they didn't license, when they actually get to the cause of action of copyright infringement, they're asserting copyright infringement against everything Barlow and Bear is doing. They're not making a distinction between the album and the live performances. I know it seems like that if you were just to read the complaint, but actually the cause of action itself doesn't make that same distinction. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One is it's better at this point for Netflix to be vague um, and to be broad, to sort of encompass as much as it can. It can obviously pare down later. The other thing is because Netflix does not want to be in the business of tacitly approving the album itself. At, ne at no point does Netflix ever want to say, oh, we approve of the audio-only album or that the audio-only album isn't copyright infringement or that they have a license to it. And so that's why I've been looking at the Spotify album. That's why Netflix's own complaint looks at the Spotify album and not the Kennedy Center live performance. So once we've established, yes, Barlow and Bear definitely took copyrighted material, although there are caveats here. Um, the next question to ask is, are there any defenses? Is there any justification? There's two flavors of potential justification here. One is that Barlow and Bear had a license to it or an implied license, or they thought they were authorized in some way. I'm not gonna get into this uh, because we only have Netflix's side of the story, but Netflix's complaint makes clear that Barlow and Bear's lawyers at least represented to Netflix that this might be a flavor of a defense that they were going to use, that they actually were licensed or authorized. Um, we do not have facts that support an implied license defense here or an actual license defense here. Maybe Barlow and Bear uh, in their answer will be able to give us some facts that will shed light onto a potential defense here. But as it is now, I'm not gonna analyze it because there's nothing to analyze. The other, the other flavor of potential defense that you see in Netflix's um, complaint is this idea that Barlow and Bear uh, has put forth that Netflix has waited too long to sue. Netflix says that that's not how copyright works. That's not how the law works. Netflix is right there. There's sort of two ways that you can argue that you've waited too long to sue. One is under a statute of limitations. A statute of limitations is like a very clear cut statutory definition of like, how long can you wait to sue? In copyright law, that's three years. Obviously, three years haven't passed since the Kennedy Center performance. Three years haven't even passed since the Bridgerton TV show was created. There's no way the statute of limitations is a defense here. The other potential flavor of that defense is latches. Latches is an equitable defense that basically just says, hey, it's unfair for you to have waited on your rights to enforce your rights for so long. And because we think it's kind of unfair that you waited for so long and the way you're doing this feels kind of icky, we're going to say you've actually can't do this anymore. Um, you're barred by latches. That's not a defense that exists in copyright anymore, really. It might for very, very extraordinary circumstances, but it's not these cases. Um, and so that's not a defense available here. And so I don't think any of those defenses really are going to hold water here, even if they seem to have been previewed by Barlow and Bear's attorneys. The big defense here is fair use. It's the one you hear about all the time. It's the one that says, yes, some uses we've decided do take from the original copyright holder. They do take copyrighted material, but we think that these uses are productive and you know useful enough for society that we're going to call them fair. We're going to authorize them even if you don't have a license or permission from the original copyright holder. And fair use law is a wild, wild west. The statute in fair use just basically says, here are these four factors to consider, go for it. 
there's no like hard rules here. Everything is kind of squishy. You've got these factors, you balance them together. It's all very, very subjective. It's unclear how much weight to give anything. It's basically like a legal test of vibes. Um, you know, do the vibes feel off? And it's a lawyer's job to try to, you know, make you feel those vibes with like very specific legal arguments. And it's why these cases can kind of go all over the place. These cases are unpredictable. And as an example, I just want to show you like some stuff that has been called fair use and not fair use and see like, can you see the difference? Like, would you have been able to predict this? Um, my favorite one is uh, Carrie V. Prince, which is this appropriation artist who took these photographs, these original photographs, made some very rudimentary changes to them and uh, called them artwork. Um, you can see that artwork here. Does this look like fair use to you? I Maybe. The court ultimately found like, yeah, this could be fair use. I certainly wouldn't have been able to predict that one. Two other cases that I think are really interesting are, there were two separate cases about basically like Dr. Seuss riffs. And, you know, one of them was found to be fair use and one of them wasn't. There's no like clear like, oh yeah, this one is obviously very fair and obviously this one is very not fair. There's other examples of appropriation art that go either way. Richard Coons has a handful of, Richard Coons has made a bunch of case law himself from taking art and some of it we decide is fair and some of it we decide is not. And I think the two cases that are most relevant here are the Gone with the Wind and Catcher in the Rye cases. These are both cases that are not fan works, but are kind of doing similar things. In Gone with the Wind, there was a book created called The Wind Done Gone um, that was essentially told from the slave's perspective on the O'Hara plantation. And it has a lot of commentary about like race and class, but it also definitely interacts and uses the original characters and the original setting. The court found that was fair use. On the other hand, there was 60 years later. This is a book that was sort of 60 years after uh, the events of Catcher in the Rye. Um, Holden Caulfield is now an old man. And the court found that this one wasn't fair use. It said basically, you know, it's doing the same thing as the original. It's talking about absurdity. We don't love it. Personally, <laughs> I think that I haven't read the novels myself, so I can't be certain I would agree or disagree with these things. But it's clear to me that it's a lot about how these things were characterized in court how the lawyers argued them, how the judges and the juries were feeling. It's not obvious to me in either of these cases how um, the outcome should have been beforehand. So now actually into what is the fair use analysis. Like I said, there are these four factors. The first factor is called the purpose and character of the use. This is the factor that includes what we now call the transformative use or transformative work. And it's the heart of a lot of these like artistic and creative fair use analyses now. What the transformative use test really asks is, is this new work got new expression or new meaning or a new message? But it's really all about like, is this an artistic work we want to promote? Like, is this the kind of work we think like, yeah, this is the stuff we want you to take something from and build something new and creative off of. In particular here, because of all the ways in which Barlow and Bear might be able to argue that in fact, we have a lot of new expression. Like, this is an album. We've created an album. There was obviously almost no parts of this album existed in the TV show. Certainly music existed in the TV show, but not an album. The other part of this first factor is about the commerciality of a work. And I think this is the part where I've seen a lot of commentary that fully doesn't understand copyright law, um, who basically say like, oh, it was fine until they sold it, but once they sold it, it was obviously infringement. Uh, and who also have been and analogize that to fan fiction to say fan fiction is only okay because we don't sell it. I don't want to get into that. That's not true. Fan fiction is not okay because we don't sell it. Nobody sues on it because you don't sell it and it's not worth it to sue on it. That's a topic for a different day. Really what I want to get into here though is just that in modern fair use analysis, the commerciality of a work is not irrelevant, but it's not very relevant. It is a explicitly been made a very small part of the fair use test now. And more importantly, Almost every work now that is found to be fair use is also commercial because those are the only ones that are involved in lawsuits. So yes, uh, the Bridgerton musical is commercial, but I don't think that affects this fair use analysis very much, contrary to popular belief. The second factor is the nature of the copyrighted work. This is a nothing factor. This basically says like, is the original work creative or is it factual? The Bridgerton TV show is obviously a creative work. This will factor will weigh in favor of Netflix. 
but courts tend not to put very much emphasis on this factor. The next factor is the amount and substantiality of the original work that's used. I think both sides are going to have really solid arguments that this factor weighs in favor of them. Uh, Netflix is going to say, listen, it took like the heart of the TV show. You know, it took the entire plot, all of, and sort of all of these huge emotional beats. It took all the significant moments of the TV show. Barlow and Bear are going to argue, actually, we didn't take very much of this TV show at all. We took literally none of the visuals. Everything we took was like purely, was either an idea, which is not copyrightable expression, or it was a handful of dialogue lines, um, but there was tons and tons of dialogue we didn't take. We didn't take any of the visuals. And so, you know, both of them are going to argue that this factor weighs in favor of them. I'm not going to be able to say one way or the other what a judge or jury will think of that. And the final factor is the effect on the market of the original work. Or obviously, again, this is a kind of a difficult question. And this is why Netflix put so much time into talking about all the stuff that they were going to make, all the merch, all their live performances, their soundtrack. That's because Netflix is not going to be able to argue that the unofficial Bridgerton musical harms the market for the Bridgerton TV show. It clearly doesn't. They don't compete. If anything, what the um, unofficial Bridgerton musical does is create extra buzz and marketing for the TV show. Certainly, Barlow and Bear will argue that, and they will argue that because of that, this factor weighs in favor of them. Netflix will argue, well, no, actually, because the of the unofficial Bridgerton musical and because of the live performances, we are unable to make our own live performances or our live performances are in competition with those. And so we are losing money here that we could get. We'll see how much those arguments play, but I think this factor, again, could go either way depending on how it's presented. The other thing about this factor is it actually bakes in um, a response to some of the commentary I've seen around this case, which is that some people are like, well, we don't love the idea of going to bat for a big corporation like Netflix, but we've got to protect Netflix's IP here because if you don't protect Netflix's IP, you can't protect a small creator's IP. It's all the same. There's no, you know, there's no difference here. And this fair use factor actually kind of addresses that a little bit. I'm not saying that that's not a valid concern, but I am saying that this factor would treat Netflix differently than it would an independent creator. Because obviously, a independent artist making fan art of a Netflix TV show is much different than a Netflix TV show taking an independent artist character and making a TV show. Why? Because in the first case, that independent artist isn't harming Netflix's market at all. In the second case, Netflix making that TV show is essentially saying to the independent artist, you absolutely in no way will ever be able to make this TV show because we've already made it. And so they've got very asymmetrical effects on this fourth factor, depending on how big the creator is and how big the derivative work maker is. And so I just want to say like, copyright does allow for at least a little bit of differentiation between the treatment of like a big corporation and an independent artist in that way. I, again, I'm not saying it's not a valid concern, but just like it is not impossible for copyright law to differentiate between these two things. And we don't have to treat them the exact same way. And so I hope a walk through these factors kind of helps explain how this test can be used in many different ways and how the outcomes can be very unpredictable. And in particular, how Barlow and Bear could, if they wanted to, at least make some arguments. I may not think that Barlow and Bear will win a fair use argument, but I think they can put on a lot of colorable arguments. And I think it could potentially be convincing to the right judge or the right jury. It depends a lot on, how, again, how it's presented, who your witnesses are, what public opinion is, like how the judge is feeling that day. Just like imagine you're on a jury and here's a bunch of potential arguments that Barlow and Bear's lawyers put on. First, Netflix is this big, huge corporation and Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear are these two young, independent creators who just wanted to create something that they absolutely loved. And in fact, Netflix was totally okay with it and encouraged them spending all of this time and effort in making this while it was still being made. But the second Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear then wanted to make some money and be fairly compensated for their works in a way that copyright law incentivizes, that's when Netflix stepped in and was being unfair and said, no, actually, we were okay with this while it was benefiting us. But now that you want to make money off of your own creative work that we have been okay with this whole time, you can't do that. Next, actually, Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear took very little from the original um, TV show. Most of what they took was, was ideas and not expression. You know, this is a 
full audio album that was made off of a television show. They took none of the visuals. They took none of the lighting, none of the camera work, none of the framing, none of the set design, none of the costuming. Moreover, this isn't even like a musical cast album. This is a full album just from Barlow and Bear. There's no Simon character singing all Simon's lines. There is only Abigail Barlow and Emily Bear singing every single part here. We don't have a differentiation between a Lady Whistledown and a Penelope and a Simon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone is Barlow and Bear. There are no actual actors. So really all they're taking is a handful of dialogue lines and otherwise it is all sort of their original expression. Moreover, not only do they not take very much from the original, but what they've actually done is a lot of their own new expression. And that new expression is the heart of the transformative inquiry. Does this add new expression? Absolutely. Almost 100% of this album is new expression. 100% of the production, 100% of the melodies, 100% of the instrumentation is all new expression. And these are songs. Isn't the production, the melody, and the instrumentation the heart of a song? Isn't that exactly what this new character is? Yes, admittedly, they took some dialogue for their lyrics, but a lot of their lyrics are original. So actually, this is the exact kind of work we want to protect in fair use. This is a core transformative work that is purely new artistic expression. And you know what, actually? Any expression they did take was from the book. It wasn't from the TV show at all. These characters originated in the book. The plot originated in the book. And also, this is a creative work, exactly the type of which copyright and fair use aims to protect. This is a valuable artistic work. You know, Netflix certainly seemed to think so as it was encouraging this. And moreover, it won a Grammy. It's sort of been recognized as the kinds of work we want to promote, hasn't it? It's got a lot of independent merit. And so fair use law should allow it. And yes, while it definitely started as something inspired by the universal themes of love and family uh, in the Bridgerton TV show, it has evolved to be so, so, so much more than that. And the final product is really a reflection and a celebration of that collaborative spirit of community, of that energy that Barlow and Bear created when they chose to document this unique experience online. What they've created actually here is not only an original artwork uh, that is an album with all their original expression, but it is that it is also further something that is a social commentary or the product of a social commentary of community build. And gosh, isn't that just the kinds of works we want these independent creators to be able to make? And if so, then shouldn't copyright allow them to profit off of that and not let Netflix, a big corporation um, that just is in it for the money, stand in the way? Again, I'm not saying I believe any of these arguments. I'm not saying that these arguments are necessarily persuasive to me, but I am saying you could put all these, run all these arguments in front of a jury and a judge, and I would not be certain which way the outcome was going to be. So I hope I've at least convinced some people that there's a lot of nuance here and that this is a complicated question or can be a complicated question. Now, what are the next steps? Well, the immediate next, next step is that Barlow and Bear will file an answer. In that answer, they will have to lay out their side of the story. We might get a fuller uh, view of what the actual dispute is once that answer is filed. In any event, this case is almost certainly going to settle before it actually reaches any of the decisions I've talked about. There's just too much uncertainty here and there's just too many reasons for both sides to want to settle early. Barlow and Bear wants to settle early because litigation is expensive. It can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars to litigate a case like this to its completion. And that's why Barlow and Bear probably wants to get to a settlement quickly. The reason Netflix wants to settle early is because they don't want to actually get to a trial. Because of the uncertainty, the closer they get to a trial, the closer they get to a potential to get an adverse decision to them. That's bad for them because an adverse decision for them is much, much worse than an adverse decision would be for Barlow and Bear. Because for them, it also would create new law, which would then be able to be used by anybody who wanted to do a similar thing with any of Netflix's other projects. Uh, that's a huge risk for Netflix, and I can see why they would not want to do that. And so because of both these reasons, I think both parties are going to kind of see that and want to settle this early. I will be watching. I am so interested in this case. I think this case brings up a lot of really interesting issues. We might not get anything more out of this case, like I said, but I kind of hope at least we get some more resolution here. And I hope that whatever happens, there's public visibility into the resolution. So I'll be following. Um, let me know if you'll be. Uh, also, I would 
love to chat about this more. As you can tell, like, this is the thing I'm really interested in. If you have any comments or any questions, um, if you're an entertainment and media lawyer and want to tell me what you think the standard clause of the <laughs> derivative works rights are going to be, also tell me that as well. But yeah, I hope this was helpful to somebody. This is not the kind of thing I would usually spend time making. I just felt so compelled to after seeing so many takes that I thought were a little incomplete. And so again, for completeness purposes, hope this was helpful. Um, I guess until next time. See ya.